Battery storage, you know, they have micro turbines and battery storage out there. All right, I see we do have a quorum I'm talking about. Yeah, I just want to do more out there. Put on there. Go ahead and uh, get started. <laughs> All right, we're going to uh, straight into action item number one execu uh, to execute a contract to implement the consumer report rebate program for Rule 1111. Tracy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if we can bring the presentation up, please. For the presentation, come up. Is there anything, anything to do without the presentation? Um, yeah, presentation? I can go ahead and get started here while they do that. Um, if, yeah. if you'll recall, back in November, we came to this committee uh, with regards to uh, a companion to our Rule 1111 amendments to talk about uh, establishing a rebate program for commercial residential furnaces. Uh, rule 1111 is a rule that uh, that we've had in place for some time. Um, this rule uh, establishes a NOx requirement for the furnaces. Uh, back in, in 2009, we adopted a 14 nanogram per joule requirement and did an amendment uh, previously in 2014 that established, because some of the manufacturers needed more time to come up with commercial units or residential units uh, to establish a mitigation fee program. But this rule applies to residential and commercial uh, furnaces. It regulates not only at the manufacturer level, but also at the distributor, seller, and installer level. Um, we do provide that mitigation fee, and it was uh, the original intent was for 36 months beyond uh, the effective date uh, of the 14 nanogram per joule requirement. But to date, um, the majority of the manufacturers, actually all the manufacturers, have been utilizing the mitigation fee program um, and passing that fee down through the consumers. And uh, they they came to us uh, about a year and a half ago asking for more time because they're still working on their development. They need to be able to develop safe, reliable, a full line of products. Um, but as a part of this rebate program, we really felt that it was necessary to have an incentive, not only for the manufacturers to produce commercial units, but also for residences to, to actually utilize that rebate program to install the compliant 14 nanogram per unit um, furnaces. So on December 1st, with the board's approval, we issued an RFP for $3 million to establish this rebate program. Um, the, we uh, went out and did our uh, solicitation for proposals and uh, went through our normal um, avenues. Uh, we had a, uh, a bidder's conference on December 19th, and we had five parties uh, participate in that bidder's conference and uh, you know communicated to them what the desires of the program were and answered any questions. We did receive uh, three proposals, three good proposals. Uh, the evaluation panel uh, looking at the proposals was uh, three SEA QMD staff members and a member from San Joaquin Air Pollution Control District. The San Joaquin Valley also has a very similar rule to what we have here. And they're very interested in what we're doing. They're, they have the same goals as us. So we included them as a part of the review panel. The uh, cost proposal was actually a, a very key component of, of looking at those proposals. Um, in summary, um, Electric and Gas Industries Association is our recommendation for awarding the contract. This is a nonprofit organization. One of the things that's really great about this is they're they're not really asking for or they're not asking for upfront uh, compensation. They're actually going to establish the program, and then their compensation is going to be tied to every rebate that's actually issued, and that rebate is tied to um, three and a half percent of the rebate incentive. So we're looking at out of the $3 million, less than $100,000 that would go to the actual administration of the program. Uh, one of the things we can do as a part of establishing that contract, um, going back to uh, Supervisor Solis's comments, is to uh, include an element that we could go out to the environmental justice communities, the low income communities, to make sure that they're aware that if they need to replace their furnace, that this program is available to them. So what we would like to do is bring our uh, recommendation to the full board on at the March 2nd. Uh, we are going to talk to our working group members about the, the overall structure and the function to make sure that the rebate program works uh, as well as it can. 
Um, and then we'll expect to execute the contract in March with a program launch in April. One of the elements of the proposal is that once the contract is executed, um, this, con this, this potential contractor can actually implement the program within 30 days. They, they are ones that um, they've already implemented similar programs for the manufacturers like Goodman, Linux, and Ream. So they're well established. They know uh, what, what information needs to go out. They know they have a uh, dealer network or con contractor network of 2,000. And uh, they can utilize that network to get the word out so that when folks are actually going and they're, they're researching, because not everybody looks for a furnace, but every maybe 15 or 20 years, these contractors will be able to tell them what's available to them. So we believe that the, this is our best approach and, and implement it as soon as possible. Very good. Do we have public comment on this item? Because yes. Unless someone has any questions okay. before. Rusty Tharp with Goodman. Just want to say that uh, we support a rebate program and we think that the levels that the, uh, are being proposed will do a very good job of moving the market towards a compliant product. So we uh, appreciate the efforts that the staff is made, working on to get that going. And uh, again, just think it will be very helpful in getting compliant products into the homes. Very good. <clears throat> good morning. I'm uh, Matt LaPanzi. I'm with Nortec Global HVAC. I'm their Director of Regulatory Affairs. And I just want to echo the comments you heard from my colleague, Rusty Tharp. We also support this program. Uh, we do believe it, it, it will serve the market well and advance this process forward. Very Thank good. You. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Winningham with Lennox International. We also support the program but are concerned with the uh, front loading of it and <clears throat> the quantity of products and will that uh, bridge the gap between the cost, consumer cost of a compliant and non-compliant product. I think South Coast should strongly consider um, looking at either additional funds to either <clears throat> increase the quantity or set the incentive based upon a time span, which ensures that compliant products will be um, uh, competitive in the market. Thank you. And, and actually, Mr. Chair, I should have mentioned that as a, uh, as a component of what we're going to do with contract implementation is once it, it gets going, we're going to monitor. The, uh, the contractor has a dashboard so we can tell in real time just how effective the program is. And if it looks like the program is being effective and we're kind of moving through the funds, uh, we'll go back and look at maybe adding more funds to the program and we'll bring that back to the committee. Very good. Good morning. I'm Harold Owens. I'm a regional sales manager for the Carrier Corporation um, based here in Southern California. And I'm representing the Carrier Corporation, which is the world's largest manufacturer of gas furnaces um, and a business unit of United Technologies Corporation, U.S.-based company in Connecticut. My purpose today is to show support for Rule 1111 and to encourage the board and South Coast to continue their proposal on extending the mitigation period and associated fees. The five reasons why. We're one of the companies that does not yet have an ultra-low NOx compliant product in the market. We're close, but not quite there yet. Um, two, by continuing the current mitigation fees, it will allow manufacturers who do not have a compliant product more time to finalize their product development and get compliant product into the market, providing the consumer with more choices. In the meantime, consumer rebates, as proposed by staff, um, should be sufficient to offset any higher prices consumers would pay for compliant products that are offered by competition during this extension period. We too have invested millions of dollars in development and technology to design and test furnaces that are not only compliant to the new standard, but dependable, reliable, and most importantly, safe. These are standards that we do not compromise on regardless of timing. By continuing the mitigation period and associated fees, this provides a balanced market approach and consumer options having multiple lines to choose from thereby alleviating the anti-competitive effects of the previously proposed fee increase in rebates. We have provided input to staff, which would reduce the complexity of a proposal by removing the tiering by BTU and better defining a propane installation. We thank you for your time today and for listening to our statement. We hope the board continues with staff recommendations 
of extending the mitigation fee. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Can I make a statement? I think the gentleman uh, was just speaking on the rule item, which is the next item on the agenda. He spoke to both. He, he did speak yeah. to both. And yeah, yes. I just want to assure the gentleman that board committee members will consider his comments on that item as well. Absolutely. Anyone else? Board members? Just, uh, I guess this, this issue, and it could come up under the next item or this item, mm -hmm. where we set that, that the number is a little bit of guesswork, right? Is that kind of... We, we, we tend to hear people from the industry saying we, we got it right, but we're going to mm -hmm. monitor it in real time, mm -hmm. figure out whether we got it right, and we will take a flexible approach if necessary. Right, right. right. It's based on a thorough evaluation thorough, okay, of all the right. data. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't suggesting it was an arbitrary and capricious that. decision yeah. on the part of the staff. It's not the dark board. Yeah, 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 it wasn't the dark board. Yeah. Yeah. We narrowed the dark board a little bit in, in the dark. But it's, okay, that's, that's good to know because mm -hmm. I think it, it's a little difficult to know exactly what the the sweet spot is. Right. Yes. Anyone else have any questions? I'll look for a motion. Oh, I'll move the Second. I have a motion and a second. All on roll call, please. Dr. Bill? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Nelson? Yeah. Supervisor Rutherford? Yes. Supervisor Salee? Aye. Mayor Benoit? Aye. Motion passes. Very good. Item number two: the summary and update on the proposed Rule 1111. Tracy. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if, if you'll recall, at the last governing board meeting, when we set the hearing for our proposed amendments to Rule 1111, we had some public testimony. We also had some interest from the governing board members about the uh, the proposed amendment and some of the changes that have been made along the way. So we wanted to bring that back to the committee just to explain and answer any questions that that you may have. Um, just kind of key to our proposal is based on the technical evaluation and actually the certifications that have come in, uh, we do believe that the 14 nanograms per joule NOx limit is achievable. It's been proven. And in fact, uh, many of the manufacturers that have uh, demonstrated their units are well below that 14 nanograms, actually well below 10 nanograms per joule. Um, one of the other elements is the continuation of the mitigation fee, which the gentleman just mentioned. For the condensing high efficiency units, we're looking at a one and a half year extension of the mitigation fee to October 2019 for standard non-condensing one year because the compliance cycle for the mitigation fee ends in the uh, first of October for a year to October 2019. Weatherized units, uh, also a one year extension to 2020. Mobile home units, because their compliance date is so far in the future, we didn't think there was a need to actually extend that mitigation fee period. Um, talking about where the commercialization is for these uh, different types of units, we have three manufacturers that have developed and certified products, not only for the standard non-condensing, but also for the high efficiency condensing units that comply with the 14 nanograms per joule limit. Uh, talking to the other manufacturers, and unfortunately those discussions are confidential, I wish I could give more details, but, but we're very, um, very confident that more units are going to come in for certification. And in fact, uh, earlier this week, one of the manufacturers who may speak to it themselves uh, <coughs> submitted certification for um, a number of units um, for the uh, condensing high efficiency. So we're actually going to have more products available in the very near future. Um, on December 4th, uh, Linux is the first to actually commercialize and make available to the public non-condensing standard units. Uh, they have it in three categories. Uh, Linux also is the manufacturer of the Allied brand. It's just kind of a different distributor track. Um, so they actually have products that are available right now within our jurisdiction available for sale. Um, other manufacturers that we've spoken to, particularly for the non-condensing units, expect to have products available in the October, <coughs> December timeline. So we're very encouraged about the product development that's going on. But e you know, even given that, we do have some of the other manufacturers that need, need a little bit more time to come up with a, a full line of, of what they call home comfort uh, products. Key to our proposal is really two elements. One is the mitigation fee, and the other is the, is the consumer rebate. The mitigation fee provides the alternative compliance option until they come up with a compliant product that they can sell. Um, and the intent is to ensure that range of furnaces are going to be available to the consumers. The, the rebate program, uh, we see that as not only providing an incentive to the consumers to buy these compliant products, but also to encourage the manufacturers to commercialize those units. But I do want to point out, because the rebate program is separate from the rule amendment, irregardless of what the governing board decides on the proposed rule, we can still move forward 
with the rebate program, which I think is very good. Um, as a part of the mitigation fee, um, there, there have been concerns about how we structured the mitigation fee program. We've done it in a tiered structure and a phased in approach. Um, what we're looking at is, and it came up at the uh, November Station Resource Committee, if you'll recall, um, about having a lower mitigation fee for the smaller units and a higher mitigation fee for the larger high efficiency units. So we took that to heart. And then also um, the, the implementation of that mitigation fee, rather than implement it right away, we're looking at doing it in phases. So we would do it uh, roughly 50% at the beginning of the compliance cycle, and then in six months, do the other 50%. So, and then in tied with that, that incremental increase in the mitigation fee, as you'll see here, um, that incremental increase will actually go to additional rebates as a part of the rebate program on top of the three million as a part of that program, as a rebate program. The, the basic mitigation fee still needs to be continued to be used for mitigation uh, emission reduction projects. And uh, if you'll recall, we, we issued that RFP in January for that large $60 million um, uh, dollar RFP to do emission mitigation uh, projects. So this is actually going to be a part of that. Um, another companion to uh, looking at what we're doing here is um, doing a couple of changes to the exemptions of the rule. The first is uh, we had a couple of manufacturers come to us and say, well, you know, by the end of uh, 2017, we've actually already gone into contractual agreements to sell units for new developments. So what we've done is we've added a, an exemption that if the OEM or the distributor has a contract that was established before January 1st, that those units, once they come into our jurisdiction, would not be subject to that higher mitigation fee. Uh, the second is we want to make sure that units that come in uh, that are converted to natural gas, um, that are converted from natural gas to propane, that that's, that that's very defined. So the a couple of manufacturers came in and said, well, you know, we have 14 nanograms per unit. We're eventually going to sell, but we would still like to be able to sell the, the higher emitting units so long as they're converted to propane. So what we've done is we've added an exemption and some conditions, including labeling, that allows them to bring those units in so long as they're designated for propane firing only. Um, some of the manufacturers have said that uh, they can't, they don't have uh, propane conversion kits for the 14 nanograms per unit, but actually we have one manufacturer that does have a propane kit that can be used. So this would allow them that flexibility to bring it in because there are areas of our jurisdiction that don't have natural gas infrastructure. So this would allow them to do that. Um, if you'll recall from the, uh, from the board meeting, um, there were some concerns raised about the changes that were made to our proposal since the one we came to the committee with in November. I do want to highlight a couple of changes. One is the mitigation fee increase. Originally, we were talking about increasing $400 for all types of units. Uh, since then, we did have uh, additional stakeholder meetings. We talked about it at the last station resource committee about having the, the lower mitigation fee for the smaller and then the higher for the high efficiency. Mm -hmm. And then based on some of the stakeholder suggestions, um, we did the tiered structure. So we have three different levels of BTU input. So it's a tiered structure for implementing the, uh, the uh, mitigation fee increase. And one of the, the, the elements of that is it allows the manufacturers and, the, and the, uh, the contractors that are actually at the bottom end the flexibility to talk to their consumers about what's the best option for them. I know there's been some concern expressed about that structure, but in trying to strike the best balance for what we've, what we've heard from everyone, we think that this tiered structure and this phased in approach is really the best way to go. The other element is when is that mitigation fee increased? Uh, originally we were proposing the date of amendment, um, but we did hear, and if you'll recall, we did hear from uh, some of the stakeholders that they can't really implement that fee increase right away. They actually need time to do that. And then also, you know, it wasn't fair to implement a, a fee increase during the middle of the compliance cycle. So that's why we were tying the fee increase to the beginning of the compliance cycle and allowing more time, uh, particularly for the condensing units where April 1st is the timeline. We're looking at allowing 60 days beyond uh, the, rule of, the rule adoption to implement that new fee increase for the, the high efficiency units. Um, some of the key remaining issues I just want to touch on um, one was the, the complexity that I just addressed uh, with some of the stakeholders. Uh, some have also commented about the fee increase effective date, which I've already covered. Um, as you heard from uh, the gentleman from Linux, they are concerned 
about uh, whether or not we have enough funds to under the rebate program to keep the incentive alive to get these products into market. So as I mentioned, we're looking at um, once the program gets going, monitoring that, and then coming back to the board is necessary to add additional fees. Uh, one other element that, that we heard some about um, is about having a sell-through period beyond the end of the mitigation fee. That was raised by one uh, distributor and one of the manufacturers. Uh, we really believe that the mitigation fee, particularly with the 12-month uh, the, the extension uh, for standard units, 18-month for the high efficiency in October 2019, that that period really functions as the sell-through period. And we believe that as the manufacturers know that they're going to be providing these compliant products within the near future, they'll be able to work with those distributors to minimize the impacts and hopefully eliminate the impacts so that they don't have any stranded furnaces within their, their warehouses at the time that the mitigation fee um, it, it ends. And, and of course, the other elements about dealing with the compliance cycle, the 60 days, um, those all lend to also assist to that, to, you know, to prevent that kind of stranded asset, if you will. So with that, Mr. Chair, we did set the hearing at uh, this last governing board meeting. Uh, we are going to continue to get feedback from the stakeholders, but we are looking to take this to the board at our next meeting. So with that, Mr. Mayor. All right. Any board member questions before we take public comment? Public comment on this item? No, we got some. No else? Yeah, I don't know if there's last time. Come on, someone <laughs> <do it. laughs> Okay. I'll go first. So <laughs> Being that uh, it's difficult to cover all the information in three minutes, I'm providing some additional information uh, that I will cover in summary. Um, Lennox, I'm Dave Winningham with Lennox. Uh, thank you again for being able to speak in regard to the Rule 1111. Lennox does plan to launch a comprehensive portfolio of compliant products in both condensing and non condensing. We plan to offer single stage and two stage products in both categories. Lennox has stepped out from the industry, driving our internal priorities to ensure compliant products would be available uh, by the current mm -hmm. compliance dates, and we have uh, invested significantly to make that happen. We oppose the current rule as it's proposed. Our position is that the current rule should be maintained with current compliance dates, or an extension of the mitigation period should be balanced with adequate economic incentives that bridge the consumer cost difference. <clears throat> the current the current rule amendment uh, places Rule 1111 compliant non-condensing furnaces at an economic disadvantage until April 2019. Lennox will continue to sell non-compliant products to protect our business until compliant products are viable in the market. South Coast's early actions, um, once we started this amendment process, were very supportive of compliant manufacturers. The recent actions tend to favor non-compliant products by extending the time period and reducing the mitigation fees. The October um, 13th draft and staff, staff report included an economic model. That economic model <coughs> uh, determined that or estimated the consumer cost increase of a compliant product to be $500. The resulting economic analysis proposed a fee increase of a mitigation fee increase of $200 to $300 and a rebate of $300 would achieve a 40% market share of compliant products. Um, at that time, <clears throat> or the following um, stationary source meeting, uh, it was agreed to move forward with the rule amendment with targeting February as the final date. Um, <clears throat> as it was proposed in, Feb in, um, in November, the rule was pretty straightforward and simple. Um, and the rebate program that went along with it was pretty simple and straightforward. <clears throat> but at realistic market volumes, the $500 rebate that's front-loaded will have an impact for less than a quarter. We're talking about a market of 150,000 units. And doing the math, 6,000 units at that increased uh, rebate level doesn't go very far. To kind of illustrate... Um, what was proposed in November, and this is included in the packet. I can also send this electronically. Um, but it kind of indicates the mitigation fee and the rebate, as well as South Coast uh, cost increase. 
clearly worked. When we take that to the current proposal, and again, with the additional complexity, when we look at non-compliant or uh, compliant non-condensing products, which are the predominant product, the area in red is the economic gap. Um, in addition, the sequent analysis uh, determined that maintain, or maintaining the current uh, rule is the most effective at, effective at reducing emissions. All the other alternatives analyzed resulted in 2.5 to 12 times the significance threshold. Kind of <clears throat> taking this back to um, our ask is we plan to continue with our development and launch of compliant products, but we can only do so if they're economically viable in the market. Um, we have a very short window of time here um, to make corrections, but we have a product in the market now, but it's faced with some pretty significant economic adversity. And uh, we just suggest to the board and respectfully ask that uh, you uphold the commitment that was stated back in June of last year to support compliant manufacturers. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. I have, uh, my name is Rusty Tharp, Director of Regulatory Affairs for Goodman. Appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, passing out the comments, I'll be not really mentioning the first two, which we, we think the, the rule is a good thing. We're here to support uh, the proposal that staff has. Uh, it hits the target on emissions. Uh, it makes sure that there's not a monopoly uh, impacting the market. Uh, the two big things I want to hit on in my three minutes is that First adopters are well compensated by the proposed rule. And second, I'll talk about consumer choice a little bit. So from a first adopter perspective, Goodman is the first adopter in condensing products. We think that the, uh, the rule as it is structured more than adequately compensates the compliant product. Uh, if you go back and look at the cost of technology that's in staff report, I think it was either August or September, um, the cost of technology is less than the mitigation fee. So one of the things you have to look at is where is the cost applied? Is it at the manufacturer level? Is it at the distributor level? Or is it at the consumer level? And that gets pretty complicated when you're looking at market analysis. So you have to consider those costs. When there's somebody that's compliant in the market, the, the mitigation fee just cannot be passed on at all. So the, the price of the compliant product set by the compliant manufacturer is uh, you're, when you're, you're first in there, you're setting the market. Um, so the, the offset cost that's there today, uh, the mitigation fee today, offsets the cost of technology. The proposed increases gives a significant advantage to the compliant product. A uh, second ma manner that the first adopters have an advantage is the administration of the mitigation. It's a challenge to complete all the mitigation plans, to do all the documentation, collect the fees. So there's a lot of administrative costs that are associated with uh, the mitigation plan. Um, and actually, the rebate itself is a third major impact on the market. So between the increased mitigation fee and the rebate, those with compliant product actually are significantly advantaged. Uh, from the consumer choice perspective, uh, I've created a table that shows the product lines that are available. This is on page three of your handout. So, and this is really the reason why we manufacturers are saying we need more time to bring compliant products into the marketplace. Um, so we went last weekend and looked at the manufacturer's websites, it's on the fourth page, and looked at the various product lines that everybody offers. So the one thing I first want to point out is that everybody pretty much has a good product line a better product line, and a best product line. And uh, within each product line, there are various options within each one. So some of these are single, the heating efficiency varies. There's uh, non-condensing at 80% AFTB. And then even within the condensing, there's typically three different levels, roughly 90, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98. Um, there's different blower motor efficiency. So there's ESC motors, constant torque, constant demand, thank you, I'm sorry. I love it. 
Um, but there's lots of options, and if you look, there's three of these product lines, all of them in good and better or best, and there are no products in good available for the market. So I appreciate the short extension. I'm Ryan Murray. I'm the Western Regional Manager for Ingersoll Rand HVAC. Um, we have three brands in this marketplace, uh, American Standard, Train, and Ameristar. Uh, thank you, Rusty, for going over uh, the complexity of furnaces. <laughs> there is a lot to know and a lot to learn, and it isn't a glove that fits one hand or a shoe that fits on one foot. Um, the extension for manufacturing an independent distribution, and their dealer base is needed. Um, the plan that you have is exactly what we need. Exactly what we need. <clears throat> I'm asking the board to please consider with careful consideration <coughs> a sell-through extension that's needed for the district. We don't have company-owned distribution here. These are your constituents that own businesses have many employees that are affected by uh, your decisions. Diversity is all around us um, in this room. Uh, in your district, there's a good argument that this might be one of the most diverse places on the planet. Um, it's a matter of choice for everyone. Everyone gets to have choices. Don't limit the end consumer's choice, please. There are so many different applications, which Rusty was alluding to, and yes, there's good, better, best, but there's, there's a lot beyond that. It's not just three choices. There's so many different model families. In, um, in our American Standard Series, guess how many families of furnaces we have? 13, with 122 different models to choose from. It's a lot of choices. We didn't dictate to the marketplace that you had to have those. The mar marketplace dictated to us that they needed those options. There's so many different types of furnaces needed for different applications. A lot of times we like to say it's high end, it's low end. It's everything in between. Not everyone is the same. People need options. So if people in your communities don't have options, what do you think would happen? My belief is that you might have a few complaints. You might have some high level frustration, a little, little pain, could be a good argument for chaos. So if we have 122 of these in American Standard, how many do we have in train? Many more. Ameristar, our entry level product, even more. So if you're thinking about going to the marketplace with three options, when we are manufacturing 300, it doesn't fit. Right, wrap it up past time. So we have to have a sell through beyond October uh, 2019. Um, it could be by uh, that date or it could be uh, the date brought into the district, but we need it uh, extended. The reason for this is our independent warehouse distributors cannot send product outside of their district. So once it's in their barn, it's theirs. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. No, oh, sir. Well, good morning. My name is Matt Lacanzi, and I'm the Director of Regulatory <coughs> Affairs for Nortec, and thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to speak here today. Nortec manufactures heating and cooling appliances for residential housing, commercial buildings, and manufactured homes. In manufactured housing, we're the market leader in providing heating appliances to OEMs and the wholesale market. <coughs> Nortec very much understands the need for emission reductions in the South Coast Air Quality Management District. However, we need additional time to ensure safe, reliable, cost-effective products are supplied to the residents of California. 
While we continue to work diligently in this effort, we recommend the district continue to consider the impacts on all stakeholders as we move through this process. Nortec supports staff's proposal as outlined in the January 9th working group meeting for extending the mitigation fee program. In that meeting, staff outlined several fundamental concepts based on input from a diverse group of stakeholders, including but not limited to ensuring sufficient consumer choices, protecting low-income consumers, and rewarding OEMs who commercialize per the original schedule. Enacting staff's proposal maintains the availability of all products and hence consumer choice. In addition, the fee increase more than offsets the manufacturing cost increase for compliant products. Therefore, this proposal creates a competitive environment which results in fair pricing to the consumer. However, not providing the proposed program extension will reduce consumer choice. To date, there are only about eight compliant furnaces in commerce out of several hundred furnaces that are needed to effectively serve the market. Providing this extension allows companies to finish critical field testing, which is necessary to ensure safety and reliability. Furthermore, the increase is smaller for lower capacity appliances, and the increase does not apply to mobile home furnaces, which are predominantly a lower income demographic. OEMs that introduce into commerce compliant products in accordance with the original program and schedule are rewarded. This notion that being first results in a disadvantage is misguided. Being first is an inherent advantage. Let's face it, it's always best to be first in the market if your technology is sound. In addition, the market wants compliant product. Also, it does not make sense to criticize the proposed program as too complex if your company is introducing compliant products. An OEM with compliant products would not be administering the proposed program. Therefore, the program is irrelevant to the subject OEM and their customers. Lastly, this proposal provides a $500 rebate for the first 6,000 compliant furnaces. And after the first 6,000, there's a provision for a $300 rebate and a $200 rebate for condensing and non-condensing furnaces, respectively. This is a very generous reward for introducing compliant product just as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your time. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am uh, Dave Stevens. I'm representing Johnson Controls. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Johnson Controls is a very strong advocate for energy and environmental sustainability. And the comments today are not just as an OEM offering a product for sale, but also as a co owner of a distribution uh, network located here in South Coast. So we have a very vested interest in the, in the direction of this rule. We have concern for trying the potential uh, consumer, installer, and distributor impacts for, uh, on this rule's uh, proposed amendments. <coughs> Our first concern is this rule's effects on market viability and impacts to consumers and distributors. While some OEMs offer products, consumers will experience very limited availability. You've seen this demonstrated several times today already by previous speakers. This is in terms of furnace input capacity, configuration, and volume. Distributors providing furnaces to installers cannot provide just any brand, but are bound to specific OEMs. OEMs which may not yet have a product. A new Ford dealer cannot sell new Toyotas. So the distributors are locked in. Binding agreements which cover months of business interactions are already in place, committing distributors to specific OEMs. And some product categories, there's only one product offered, which can result in the intended consequences of treating a market, creating a market monopoly. The consumers can only be negatively impacted by this business environment and will be encouraged to buy product of lower efficiency and higher emissions, if for no other reason than product availability. <coughs> Strategy inventory will be a problem for distributors. The effects of hard stop dates, that is the end of mitigation period contained in proposed amendments are more than just dates beyond which non-compliant products cannot be sold. Supply chain typically takes 90 to 120 days to phase down for longer periods possible. Enforcing hard stop effectivity dates will affect contractors who will be unable to accept jobs that require equipment that's not yet available to them but is no longer available due to the hard stop dates. 
Remember, a Ford dealer cannot sell new Toyotas. And an upflow furnace can't be installed in place of a horizontal furnace. We strongly encourage the use of soft stop dates, such as sell-through periods, to allow for on-hand inventory needs to address the full range of product offerings, as long as reasonable development progress is being made. If we don't do this right, there will be substantial equipment bootlegging into the replacement market. The last concern for us is the mitigation fee tiers. Uh, its complexity has been voiced by those most impacted, distributors and contractors. As these are our customers and your voters, it is a concern for us. We understand the reasons for the tiered fees, but we believe the phased approach to fee increases with a fixed fee for affordable manufactured housing address the concern of a low-income consumer. If the fee structures are too cumbersome, it will create confusion, encourage furnace repair, thus further delaying the effects of the air quality regulation. You're over your time, so please wrap it up. One last little bit here. South Coast has the OEM's attention. You've got our attention. And the OEMs are working to meet the emission reduction targets. JCI recommends South Coast continue with the existing mitigation fee structure while developing metrics to better assess market viability, consumer adoption of available compliant units, and allow distributor agreements to better align with rule, amend or rule amendments. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So once, and twice. All right. Board members, comments, questions? Go ahead. Um, well, we've heard from a couple of the manufacturers on the selfie period. And so, could we comment a little bit further on that? I mean, it seems like um, they're they have, in a kind of a catch-22. They may not have compliant products, so they may be getting more non-compliant products to meet the market demand. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they've got to sell through by certain dates. So I'm wondering how we can work with that to... Um, well, you know, we the, the standard was adopted more than nine years ago. And so product development was slow to begin, obviously. And now it's coming online and, and it's speeding up. But the as I mentioned, the continuation of the mitigation <laughs> fee and manufacturers knowing when they're going to have products made available to the to the public. Um, it, that mitigation fee to us really does act as kind of a sell through. So we believe that there should be a synergy between the distributor and the manufacturer to minimize by the end of the mitigation fee date how much product is actually in the warehouse. So Mayor Mitchell, if I can add, we, we you just heard about like hard end dates. We hope that this does, by October of 2019, we hope to have this whole you know, it's presented a lot more compliant units towards the beginning of next year. So it's that's the point where you know things can start to switch over with the manufacturers and the distributors well in advance of an October, that October hard end date. So we're not expecting non-compliant units, hopefully, to we hope to not even get into the tier two of the mitigation fee. Hopefully everything comes out quickly and then they're still gonna have time, six months, whatever, to um, to be able to sell through. So it's not so much like such a hard end date, we hope long before October 2019, this transition starts to occur based on what's going to be available and based by, on the rebate and the mitigation fee structure that's <coughs> set up. And for those predominantly yeah. sold units, the standard units, essentially from the day of adoption, there's 18 months for them to actually, you know, deal with that sell through. And the majority of the manufacturers we've talked to, it sounds like most of them are going to have their compliant products by the end of this year. So that would give them an additional nine months. Mm -hmm. To, to, to actually work through that whole distribution manufacturing process. Are there instances where a um, distributor is dealing with a manufacturer that doesn't have a compliant product? And I assume there are those, those, those there, situations. And so they're going to have to sell either what's in their warehouse or get new non-compliant products mm -hmm. in order to stay in business. This is one area of concern. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and I fully understand that. Um, the I think I know which one you're talking about, but not naming names, of course. Um, the the manufacturers, as they start to develop compliant products, I know that the distributors feel like they need to have a bulk of product available in their warehouse. But as the as the, the compliant products come online, they're being manufactured. The the need to actually have many many units of a of a of a comfort line aren't really necessary. They should be able to work that out so that they just minimize the number of units that are going to be, you know, retained by the end of the mitigation fee. 
And, and obviously the concern is the front-loading concern with the sell-through yeah. period. Essentially, you might be extending uh, that compliance date just by manufacturers <coughs> front-loading, uh, you know, a warehouse with non-compliant units, and that October slips into, you know, three six months later. Um, but the hope is that the compliant the compliant products are out there and available and long before October of 2019. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, you know, we heard, I think, conflicting claims about whether the cost increase of the compliant product product was going to be ballpark $500 less or more. Um, the manufacturer who has a compliant product is saying that we've set this up in the wrong way and the others were saying no we set it up in the right way um, how did staff address these differing claims about what the costs are involved and and whether or not the incentives and the penalties or, 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 or mitigation fees are actually in the in the right room, all set up in the right way right well one of the things we <clears throat> we tried to do in, in speaking with the manufacturers was to get an idea from them, at least at the manufacturing stage, what's the incremental cost of, of a compliant furnace. But then, and that, that ranges anywhere from say 100 to $150. Most of them said it's about $150 per unit. But then there's the pass through of that cost through the distribution chain to the distributor, to the retailer, to the, to the contractor. Because so by the time it costs, every it, it costs all those people more money to carry a, a they, they, lower polluting product. They pass it there's through. a multiplier effect. They, yeah, there's, there's a multiplier effect, effect. and uh, based on the information we received from the manufacturers, I, I passed economics, but that just doesn't make a it, whole lot of sense to me. But it's 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 what they do. So based on on that, talking to the manufacturers in general, that that increase was 450 to 500 dollars on average. So, Dr. Lewis, if I can add the uh, the manufacturer who had issues with the way it was set up and not being an advantage that and that chart that he showed assumes essentially that the three million dollars of the re rebate runs out and it, and and it might it, i mean it's a good thing if it runs out it means we're losing the compliant product right, right. But we're committing to track that and come back and if 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 we see that the compliant products are being disadvantaged we have ways to add money to that program to keep it above right. that red yeah. line okay because right. i think that that is the concern i, mm -hmm. I, I do think that the structure certainly advantages the people who have compliant products at this point. So that's yes. what we want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that we have to keep an eye on it. So but, uh, other than that, I, I think you guys have created a, a, the right, uh, even it's, even though it's complicated, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's the right combination of, of uh, mm -hmm. fees and, and increasing fees and, and uh, combining that with, with yeah. the uh, rebate program. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's worth a go, and, but we have to keep an eye on it to make mm -hmm. sure that, that uh, mm -hmm. we've we, we target it the right way. Yes, sir. And that and our recommended contractor is going to have like that dashboard approach yeah. online, and we'll be able to track that very much in real time to be able to assess the impact of the program. Yeah, I mean, with the rule implementation, it might be not quite as as precise, but we will have an idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. okay. I was just going to say what I hear staff saying is that mitigation fee and sell through accomplishes the same purpose. Yes, ma'am. So why wouldn't we want both? Why wouldn't we want the sell-through period extended along with the program we're doing so we get to the same end? Well, I, in, in our view, we, you know, we, we adopted this by the time the mitigation fee in, increase or the mitigation fee ends. It's been over 10 years since we adopted the standard. So we feel that with that, <coughs> with that mitigation fee increase, it just serves that same purpose. So we think that they're, they're they're able to work. They should be able to work it out. And, and if I can add, the um, it does delay emission reductions. It would. Yes, and it would. Talking about disadvantaging the compliant products, any sell through would have that same effect, right? That went beyond October 2019. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds to me like we're also talking about disadvantaging disadvantaged people who we want to buy the new product. I I just think we can do better on the sell through date. Anyone else? Uh, I also agree with that, and especially when I look at the chart, and I don't see any units for the lower end tiered market, and that's where you're definitely disadvantaging a disadvantaged community. And I've got a lot of that in my backyard in Wildemar, too. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I see a concern. Um, you know, Philip, you talk about front loading. 
these guys are not going to want to have extra non-compliant units at the end of the date when there's a hard, let's say we give them another 180 days, at that 100 days they can't sell them anymore. I don't see the anticipated manufacturer. I, I used to be in the computer business. I can't imagine buying extra components knowing that I'd have to stop selling them in, in the future. I'd buy the last one, hopefully, and hopefully that leaves the warehouse earlier than that date. But so I, I'm concerned about that, and I do think we maybe need to look at at least maybe a 90-day sell-through date past that October date, just to give a little bit of wiggle room. And especially when I I worry, I, I, you know, maybe this is we bring it back to us a year from now and see if we have a compliant unit in that category. Um, and if we don't, come February of next year, okay, maybe we have some extra timeline to get us past, you know, that 90 days. So. My recommendation, at least, we, we want to bring this back to this body uh, a year from now to see where we're at and see how many compliant units are on the market and, at a minimum. So. Okay. so move forward as recommended and include a provision to come back and report yeah. on status. And we'll add that to the resolution. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. <coughs> that this was just a. Uh, Warm up. <laughs> yeah, warm up. Right, there you go. Body. Let's see if that resolution is enough. Um, on to the next information line, the annual reclaim audit. Bucky, I hear this is a bit of a repeat. Uh, it, it's a repeat. It's a standard item that we bring every February to the committee and march to the full board. I can skip the presentation, or if you want to, I can go straight to the last slide. Other public comments on this item? <coughs> Not seeing any. Any board member questions? And if Supervisor Solis, you know, has the burning desire to hear the rest of the presentation, no, you know, I can privately. Yeah, <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item number four: the summary of proposed amendment rule CAR 1178. David, where's he at? It might be in the overflow room. Uh, uh, he's in the overflow room. Okay. There he is. Very good. Lucky went down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Lock, we're Lock, not anticipating so. getting locked down so quickly, huh? Thank you. Thank uh -huh. you. Um, good morning, Chairman Benoit, Vice Chair Lou, uh, Station Resource Committee members. My name is David DeBoer. I'm a new Planning and Rules Manager, and I oversee the Area Sources Compliance Unit and uh, several uh, VOC and Toxics Rules teams. And I'm here today to talk to you about proposed amendments to Rule 1178, and that is uh, further reductions in VOC emissions from stationary storage tanks at petroleum facilities. So um, by way of background, some of you on the committee may recall last year in May of 2017 there were amendments to Rule 219. Those amendments um, included a resolution for staff to uh, look at and direct staff to look at ways to uh, introduce amendments to Rule 1178 that would incorporate the US EPA STIRP agreement. What that was, was back in 2000, the US EPA put together a storage tank emission reduction program, and that agreement basically outlined certain uh, mechanisms that are used as VOC reductions for these types of uh, stationary storage tanks. Um, the Resolution also addressed staff to go and look at various mechanisms in order to look at the way that we can minimize permitting requirements for these types of VOC control technologies for Rule 1178 floating tanks, floating roof tanks. So this is what these amendments are going to look at and incorporate these technologies that were addressed in the uh, EPA STIRP. So Rule 1178 um, basically addresses the VOC emissions from uh, large storage tanks at petroleum facilities. These are tanks that are greater than 19,815 gallons in capacity and also um, at petroleum refineries or petroleum facilities that produce more than 20 tons per year. Now, within Rule 1178, there are certain provisions for guide poles. And these guide poles are essentially, um, as you can see in the uh, diagram there, it's a pole that's in place to basically minimize the movement of the floating rough and to guide it as the levels in the tank move up and down. So in the Rule 1178, there are certain control configurations that are already addressed, uh, and we wanted to include um, additional information that was addressed in the STIRP agreement uh, such as a flexible enclosure system. So that was the main reason for opening the rule. 
Uh, as I mentioned, there's already certain control configurations in there for things such as pole sleeves, pole wipers, and floats, but we wanted to also recognize the uh, flexible enclosure system. So along those lines, um, the staff is proposing to address certain parameters for these flexible enclosures, such as the fact that this should be made of a VOC imperial uh, material and that you want it to be resistant to UV radiation. If you look on the right side on this particular slide, you'll see a typical installation of one of these flexible enclosures. And staff is also suggesting that these be double clamped at both the top and the bottom and then secured to the roof of the tank. Um, obviously, we want it to be free of holes and tears and rips and things like that. And so as an additional um, configuration in the uh, rule, we're telling them that we also uh, are going to expect maintenance and reporting requirements as uh, addressed in attachment A, where they have the reports that need to be filled out. And there have been some additional, just small minor clarifications in the rule. The key issue um, is uh, from the stakeholders that they would like to see these uh, exemptions for these types of uh, uh, flexible enclosure systems in 219. So staff is committed to working to uh, amend Rule 219, uh, hopefully concurrently with Rule 1178, to uh, address and recognize the flexible enclosure systems and in 219 to allow these flexible enclosure systems with the other configurations, and in particular a pole sleeve, to be allowed to be exempt from permit requirements. Uh, at that point, um, I really have nothing other to say other than we are going to try to set the hearing on March 2nd, and we would like to hold the public hearing in April. Very good. Questions before comments? Good. Well, you note that you'll need a change to Rule 219 to provide the exemption. I mean, how soon can that be done? Um, that's a great question. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just within the last hour or so, we've still been working internally to uh, accomplish that. And our goal is to have rule language available as soon as possible. As soon as possible. Okay. Yeah, so, so <laughs> the, but we want to well, we want to bring it with the uh, April 1178 amendments. Uh, so we're just making sure that we dotted our eyes and crossed our T's and all the noticing. And so uh, we believe that we can bring it uh, to the April board meeting with 1178 as an administrative amendment. Very narrow. Okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you. So what's the difference between a sleeve and a flexible enclosure system? So uh, a the pole sleeve is internal to the pole? Exactly, yeah. Um, the pole is actually internal within yeah. the hollow um, pole itself, the slotted guide pole, and it extends down into the liquid surface. Um, staff believes that uh, based on all the information, that as long as you have that in place and you use a flexible enclosure, that there should be no uh, increases in emission whatsoever. Public comment? Hello, Susan Starr, Regulatory Affairs Manager with Endeavor, formerly Tesoro. And we wanted to thank staff for their work on this rule, for um, responding to <coughs> questions and issues that arose and even taking the time to make two site visits to come out and see a flexible enclosure in place. So we appreciate the concurrent development of the 219 language and look forward to seeing the draft. Sounds like any moment. And uh, just wanted to show our appreciation. Very good. Anyone else? Okay. Any other board member comments, questions? All right. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> Next item, summary and update on proposed rule amendment uh, 1469. That's one from you. Susan. Okay. So while they're pulling up the presentation, uh, we did brief stationary source committee in November. Mm -hmm. um, we have made some additional modifications to 1469, continue working with the working group to uh, on all the variety of different issues that are that come up. Uh, there's a... Uh, um, been a very long rulemaking process. Uh, we've had 10 working group meetings. Uh, we're headed towards uh, the 11th working group meeting. 
um, but I think we're making good progress. So uh, 1469 applies to chromium, uh, electroplating and acid, chromic acid anodizing facilities. There's 115 facilities in our basin. Uh, there's a lot of variety in these facilities and the size. Some of these are very small mom and pop facilities. Uh, some of them are uh, um, much larger. So um, the impetus for this uh, rulemaking was um, uh, in large part due to the uh, monitoring that we've done in Paramount and at other uh, facilities that uh, conduct 1469 uh, activities. And so uh, we are tightening the rule and um, adding additional requirements for the what we're referring to these as Tier 2 tanks that are currently tanks that we identified that are currently not controlled. So those tanks will have to put on pollution controls. Uh, other provisions of the rule include additional requirements for best management practices, enhancing the housekeeping requirements. There is already a suite of housekeeping requirements, but in some uh, areas we'll be increasing the frequency of uh, implementing those housekeeping provisions. Um, and then also requirements for building enclosures. So the rule does not require a total enclosure under negative air. However, it does require uh, certain provisions when, uh, that the operations be conducted within a building and certain openings uh, that there's no cross draft, that we don't want uh, fans that are pulling air directly out, uh, that we want that to be filtered. Uh, so there's certain provisions uh, for the enclosure, but it's not requiring the building to be completely sealed up. Uh, the rule does include, uh, which was a comment that we had received at the Station Resource Committee, uh, a phase-out plan for he hexavalent chrome that allows facilities and an incentive for facilities that uh, if they have a Tier 2 tank that uh, they can submit a plan to us on how they're going to be phasing out hexavalent chrome. Uh, we have heard from uh, one, of, uh, one vendor that they do have uh, a process to eliminate the use of hexavalent chrome for uh, certain sealing processes. We've uh, discussed this also with the Metal Finishing Association. So uh, we think that this is uh, something that we can see for certain types of applications or for sealing processes that are associated with chromic acid anodizing operations. Um, so um, one of the new pieces of information that came about was um, in 2012, the uh, EPA's NESHAP for chrome plating and anodizing uh, banned a material called PFOS. So it required uh, not only the South Coast AQMD, but nationwide we needed to reformulate the chemical fume suppressants. And so uh, the South Coast AQMD worked with the California Air Resource Board to recertify fume suppressants that, that no longer had the PFOS um, ch chemicals in it. So um, as this came up at the last station resource committee, and then since then, we received some toxicity reports from OEHA on these non-PFOS fume suppressants. Um, the information that was included in those uh, did highlight some uh, the potential for potential adverse impacts, uh, but there was still information that was lacking in there to make a full conclusion on how we want to move forward on the use of chemical fume suppressants. So, um, there was very limited health data on the fume suppressants, and also um, there was no information on, on exposure. Uh, so stakeholders have commented that they, some stakeholders have commented that they want to eliminate the use of fume suppressants. Uh, they want to see that the uh, that their uh, uh, folks remove it and solve pollution controls or completely ban uh, the use of hexavalent chrome uh, for certain operations. So the challenges in terms of banning um, the chemical fume suppressants is that the provision in Rule 1469 uh, to allow the use of chemical fume suppressants is only allowed for the facilities, the smallest uh, facilities that are affected by the rule. So in general, those facilities uh, generally have an amp hour less than about 500 amp hours per year. And if you were to look at uh, permitted amp hours, it's on average for all facilities under 1469, it's about 31 million. So just to give you sort of that picture of these are really the smaller facilities. Um, the rule also, uh, we've done emissions testing uh, for the use of chemical fume suppressants. So we know that there's, uh, that they're very effective at reducing hexavalent chrome. 
Um, in terms of what the ban would mean for these facilities, these are probably the smallest of the small in the 1469 universe. You're talking about one to five employees for some of these uh, companies that would be affected. Uh, the capital cost alone would be about 160000 and then the, you have the ongoing uh, operation and maintenance of HEPA filtration and filter replacement and other things that would go along with that. So. Um, and then the last piece is that we don't really have the information on in regards to the exposure impacts of the fume suppressant. Not we know what the emissions coming from the tank for hexavalent chrome that you get a, about a 99% reduction with using the fume suppressants, but we don't know what the emissions are coming off of a tank uh, for the fume suppressant itself. So we need to do emissions testing to understand that. So we feel that we need to move cautiously, uh, understanding the impacts to the business, not knowing exactly what the exposure impacts are, and that this is very effective at uh, reducing hexavalent chrome, which is a known human carcinogen, one of the more potent human carcinogens that, that we regulate. So what we've incorporated into Rule 1469 is a process uh, to recertify and re evaluate these fumes of presence to allow our agency to work with the California Air Resources Board to, to do some testing on the fume suppressants to better understand the amount of emissions of the fume suppressant that are coming off of the tank to understand what the potential exposure impact would be. And if it if we decide that we cannot recertify these fume suppressants, that we feel that we need to ban these fume suppressants, the rule lays out the schedule for the facilities, putting them on notice that if we decide that we're going to ban the fume suppressants or certain fume suppressants, this is the timeline that they would need to install pollution controls. So um, from the time that we we give ourselves up till uh, July 1, 2020. Uh, we may finish that work earlier. If we finish that work earlier, it gives them more time if, they're, if we find out there's a problem. Uh, but we feel that putting this and incorporating the schedule into the rule uh, lets everybody know, puts a schedule for us, and we know what we need to do. It puts a schedule for the facilities knowing that if there, we need to ban it, this is what they would need to do. Um, so, um, you're probably going to hear a, a variety of different issues. We tried to summarize uh, the main issues. So, uh, the issue on the chemical fume suppressants, there's two sides. One, one uh, set of comments that you may hear is that um, environmental and community groups feel that we should ban the chemical fume suppressants, the concern for exposure. Uh, we, we don't understand the exposure. We need to do the emissions testing. Uh, on the other side, um, from the industry representatives, they feel like We've done a lot of work on the other aspects of the rule on for these tier one tanks that we're adding controls on the uh, best management practices, on the uh, enclosure requirements. Uh, let's bifurcate the rule. Let's put this other part that we've just added. Let's add that, that later. We think that it's a better approach just to put this in the rule. We have the schedule. If we were to come back later in rulemaking, the time frame to install controls could be even longer. If we know up front we need to help to get funding for these smaller sources, we, we, we can start working on that now. Second issue uh, that you're going to hear is in regards to the building enclosure requirements. There's a, a variety of different uh, building enclosure requirements. Um, some folks will say, um, may comment that uh, the cost of the requirements for the building enclosures is, is very high. We are not requiring uh, a total enclosure uh, under negative air that's vented to pollution controls. That's a contingency requirement that if you fill two source tests in 48 months or you fill other parameter monitoring, then you would be subject to the total enclosure, that type of requirement. But the base requirements in the rule for building enclosures are um, if you have two openings on the side, on two ends of the building, we want one side that's closed off. We're all, we feel that the provisions that we have are reasonable. We're continuing to work with the industry in regards to the, um, the language so that it's not vague. Uh, and we also have a provision that if there's a conflict with Cal OSHA, they can submit to us an alternative provision so it's, it's not in conflict. But we've been in discussions with Cal OSHA. They reviewed our rule, so we feel pretty confident in the structure of our rule uh, that it's not in, in conflict. Um, a third issue that, that you might hear is in regards to the ambient monitoring. So there um, have been requests through the rulemaking that uh, folks believe that the rule should have an amb a component of ambient monitoring in the rule. And that 
Um, we have decided that the that ambient monitoring would not be included in Rule 1469, but we have a separate rule that's uh, on our rule forecast report for this year that we would do ambient monitoring for not just uh, 1469 facilities, but other uh, facilities emitting toxic air contaminants, not just hexavalent chrome, but a sweeter, broader uh, look at um, uh, other toxic air contaminants. We feel that that's a uh, that more universal approach for looking at toxics in the ambient monitoring rule um, is a better approach than uh, working with individual industries and individual rules. So the schedules were um, setting hearing in March uh, with a public hearing in April. Very good. Board member questions before public comment? I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the testing health impacts and you know that really bothers me that uh, we don't we're not able to I guess obtain adequate information about uh, what currently is is happening on the ground and who who are we um, working with I mean I know our Department of Public Health may be available to assist in some ways and this is a this is a big issue for us particularly in uh, low-income areas because we know that there, there tends to be a, a greater presence of these uh, small businesses and and where they're placed very in some place in some cases very close and adjacent to neighborhoods uh, on the same block or around the block um, and I, I just have some really strong concerns and I think it is important to look at uh, what those impacts are and to also consider you know a rule that would uh, test for this in particular. So, go ahead. To include that, to include that in the rule. So the rule actually does that. So well, you were just, you were just. I'm, the I'm rule just, has a source testing provision for the tanks. Mm -hmm. And so it requires that the tanks be tested um, once every two years and uh, to um, look at the emissions that are coming from the tanks. But in, but I think, are you referring to an ambient monitoring? Yes. Yeah, and that will be included in the Rule 1480, mm -hmm. uh, which is coming later this year. And so um, not exactly sure what that rule is going to look like, but there will be uh, some monitoring aspects and that would you know not apply just to 1469 facilities, but other facilities that are emitting toxics. And there's other monitoring programs that will be going into place through 617, through the MITES program. And, and I thought, I'm sorry, Supervisor, I thought you were referring to the fume suppressant aspects and the study associated with the fume suppressants as it relates to the smaller facilities. Because that's where those right. um, facilities really rely on the fume suppressant aspect. Uh, and then with regards to who would be working with, that would be with OEHA and others. I mean, I don't know if the Air Resources Board as well. But I think it's important to recognize that the main purpose here is to protect mm -hmm. from the hexavalent chromium. Right. And I know Dr. Fine and others would sort of say that when you look at the PFOS alternatives, you know, the ban from EPA was driven because of water impacts, mm -hmm. not because of the air impacts. Right. Probably you were briefed on that, so I don't need to go into that. So trying to get the data working with the other groups to understand what those impacts are, uh, I think we have the monitoring programs that are in place that will be continued to be worked on. We'll continue to get the data and that as soon as we have that information, approximately two years, 18 months to two years, we can then begin knowing whether or not we move forward on the rule development, the replacement, or the control aspect. Just think, uh, well, two years is a long time for some people when it's a matter of their health impacts and exposure. So mm -hmm. we can try to work as quickly as we can <laughs> with OHIA. Yeah. They're just sometimes not the quickest. Yeah. Well, I had some of the same concerns as a supervisor. Um, I know the community has been up in arms that for the fume suppressants. And as I understood, what Susan said was that we will have some definitive answer on this by 2020. Right. So they, we, we put the, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a self-imposed requirement for us to have that answer. 
uh, by 2020. And then in the meantime, I think what I understood was you would allow room <coughs> suppressants only on very, the smaller facilities. It's currently allowed for, for the smaller facilities. So <coughs> if we decide that we can't certify them, those all facilities wouldn't be able to, to use those chemical fume suppressants. So I think when we if we do hit that juncture, then I think we're going to have to really talk about funding and other ways that we can help these facilities. Um, I've been to a number of these. They really are the smallest of facilities. Could, um, could you also touch on the trivalent aspect with regards to some of these facilities versus the hex? Yeah, if we can help to um, to move these facilities into trivalent chrome, uh, hexavalent chrome is is you know the carcinogen aspect of it. If we can move in, them into the less uh, toxic trivalent would be the goal. Uh, and so there is a provision that, that is embodied in the ban for if we need to ban the fume suppressants that uh, will provide an incentive for somebody to give them that extra year to um, to move out of hexavalent chrome and go into trivalent or any other type of process. So um, I think as we move through this and we start to, you know, through the testing, then I think we will also have to do sort of that harder look to understand the availability. And DEC is probably DEC chrome plating of any of the... Decorative? You know, yeah, decorative chrome plating. You have hard chrome plating, <laughs> chromic acid anodizing, and decorative chrome plating is probably the one area where you have probably the, you know, the greatest opportunity uh, for looking at alternatives. And let me just add that uh, the legislature is aware of this issue, particularly the speaker's office. And the speaker's office is uh, very engaged with regards to trying to find funding for this matter. So it's something that we're trying to work from both the health aspect, from the financial resources aspect. And then there's also a 617 component into it, which would focus on some of the mitigation within communities. And part of what we're talking about is most of the Mitigation right now is, well, the only mitigation right now is on the Carl Moyer and Prop 1B. But within the governor's budget, there's some flexibility to look at some of the stationary sources as well. So we've been trying to really highlight the need for flexibility to address these kind of issues. So I think there's a lot of different avenues that we can use to address this, but this still allows us to move forward in a protective fashion mm -hmm. and puts everyone... Um, aware of where our intent is and how we move forward, as opposed to the bifurcation where we don't get those protections immediately. We sort of delay and kick it down the, down the road. How many um, small facilities are involved with, with this fume suppressor? So we estimate that there's 27 facilities that are using uh, chemical fume suppressants as their sole means of control. Uh, there's some facilities that will use chemical fume suppressants and uh, another uh, air pollution control. Uh, technology. So uh, those are the ones that we'd be of uh, probably need to um, go into an add-on control type of a pollution control. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I ask some questions? Sure. So you, the ones who aren't using fume suppressants are using engineered control technology, right? That's correct. And it costs about, you estimated, $160,000 per facility? Right. Well, per... Not per facility, it per would be tank. per tank. Uh, yeah. Okay, so it could be much more expensive. Depending, 27, yeah. we have to figure out how many tanks there are. Let's go for the number. I mean, because if there is money, we need to know what the number is in order to get there. Um, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I went to college. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, I can't believe how old I am each day I wake up. Um, but when, when I went to college, Oh, Joe, it makes me like older than a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure. I think so. You might be surprised. Um, they they taught me about type one and type two error, right? You know, one is when when you think something is true and it's actually false, and one's when you think that something is false and it's actually true. It wasn't until after I got out of college that someone much smarter than my college professors taught me about type three errors which is, you could be asking the wrong question. <laughs> and I can't help but think, when we deal with hexavalent chromium, that we're always asking the wrong question. And here, I mean, obviously, we need to move forward with controls and, and, and reduce emissions and, and, and exposures as much as we can, as quickly as we can. This 
fume suppressant issue is extraordinarily frustrating. And I think we have to spend as much time and effort on the alternatives as we do on the rulemaking and considering the toxicology of the fume suppressants. When you started talking about that, I went back up and pulled up just the first one of the OEHA studies that, that when they looked at this. Because I remembered that I was kind of shocked. And this is just for one of the four, I think, that they, they, they you guys certified as being effective as fume suppressants, but not as effective as protecting people against toxicolo uh, toxicological impacts. And the impacts are systemic tox toxicity, changes in liver and or kidney morphology function, endocrine disruption, changes in reproductive organs or developmental delays, increased mortality, decreased body weight in offspring via mother's milk, uh, fluorosis, including associated problems with bones, teeth, and thyroid glands. And, and you know, all these, these really horrific impacts that OEHA associates just one of the four they, they didn't have extensive, if I remember correctly, I haven't looked at all four recently, but they, they, they were similar. I mean, the, the things that they did have information about, and they cited a bunch of studies here for those, those findings. This substitute for PFOS is, is pretty scary uh, when it comes to potential health impacts. So let's not make the mistake of substituting a, you know, a solution to the PFOS problem that is just going to create other problems down the line. Let's make sure we're not asking the wrong questions. Let's focus on what these alternatives are, how we can work with the industry, because I think the industry is much more open than we assume to finding alternatives that are not toxic, that don't require, you know, RICRA Part B permits or something. I mean, and that, and, and that they can still have a viable industry, because I, I think there's a solution out there that solves all these problems especially with a speaker being willing to come up and put money in the air pollution control fund that we can, we can access and help with these facilities. And um, it's just really kind of frustrating and a little scary. Uh, I hate it when you guys bring to us, you know, proposals that, okay, choose between this toxic and that toxic. I, I, I don't like that. <laughs> so let's try to avoid it. All right. Comment on that, or we need to take public comment. I recognize we have five minutes left in the meeting, so please we can keep it short. Come on down, public comment on this item. And by keep it short, you have one minute. Brutal, <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> brutal. Members of the board, I'm Wesley Turnbull, uh, president of the Metal Finish Association here in Southern California. Speaking on behalf of all the California associations, our industry is a small one, uh, making up less than one percent of hexavalent chrome. I don't want to speak to the PFOS <laughs> issue. Uh, I think. You guys will figure that out. Uh, but I want to keep those separate. As uh, as such, I invite you as a small facility to come in and visit mine. Uh, I know Dr. Lou has and encouraged others to. Uh, it's probably the biggest of the family owned the businesses. You get a feel for it. Uh, the district staff and the industry are aware that we can reduce emissions by a, a high percent. Again, say 90% by controlling newly discovered tanks and eliminating cross drafts. It's been proven out, been proven out through monitors. Uh, we, of course, <coughs> want to do these costly things for the sake of our employees, for the sake of the communities, and, uh, and ourselves, and our families. At, at issue now is how much further do we go, given the extreme economic costs for small companies, on things we don't really know, unknown gains, if any, uh, to add several things. So let me mention a few here. Um, there's, we, we call them Tier 1 tanks. They're non- or negatively emitting tanks. Uh, we've got all sorts of ideas of what to do with that and the rules. We've got building enclosures that are all pretty intense, down to that 3%, and redundant with the fact that we're going to put source controls on what we know is the issue and handle it there. They're very costly. Uh, it creates heat problems, which is a serious health effect for our employees, uh, the, the exposure to that. Uh, there's just a lot of redundant and expensive things in here. You'll hear more from some of my colleagues. Uh, we've got the, the Tier 2 tanks, which we know are emitters, uh, and so we're going to put controls on them, and rightly so, um, but we want to use a curve uh, for the accuracy. Right now we just have very little tests, uh, and we're using extreme numbers, which is good, uh, but we want to use a curve to get to those numbers, make the rule more elegant and, uh, and accurate. We've got temp temporary negative air enclosures just showed up, in the rule on whenever we make a modification on the, on the roofs. This is a 30-year chronic issue. We don't have to worry and start building really hard enforced, really expensive stuff on the roof every time we change a, a vent or something up there. 
We don't need that in the rule. Uh, again, very costly for these little companies. We don't know if it's going to do any or much good. Permanent total closures, we talked about it. It's still in the rule. There's a trigger. The trigger to me doesn't match well with what we're doing. I don't know why it's in there. If the controls don't work on a tank, that tank should be shut down. You've got, got the enforcement mechanisms. It's been proven out. We can shut those tanks down, and we should. We don't need to say, and now we're going to make you go to a million-dollar uh, enclosure on your building uh, to boot. Those things are in the rule. Uh, so redundancy, uh, these additions with little gains, uh, little known gains, um, things we're still figuring out, they've got to be dealt with in the proposed rule before we finish getting there. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sam Bell with uh, Metal Surfaces Incorporated, also a member of the Metal Finishing Association, but I'm representing Metal Surfaces Incorporated. Um, the aer aerospace industry uses metal finishing a lot, and they use anodized, they use hexavalent chrome in the chrome plating operation. It just need to take into account what it could do to the local aerospace industry, as well as across the nation, as AQMD promotes these rules. The rest of the nation picks up on it, and they do the same thing. So all I'm saying is be smart and understand the ramifications of the rule before finalization, such as the requirement of tinting with HEPA when installing, modifying, or removing equipment. That be becomes a very expensive temporary uh, uh, for a short-term modification that's being performed at the time. Uh, be smart about such as placement of HEPA on building enclosure roof openings. Don't ban mechanical exhaust ventilation equipment outside of the 15-foot zone that does not violate any other rules. Don't initiate, don't annihilate small processors with forced wetting agent dates before proper studies are completed. Um, and I also ask you that we incorporate building occupancy and ventilation requirements into the rulemaking process. Uh, I don't know what my time is, but... Uh, Thank you very much for listening to me. I got more to say, but anybody that wants to visit a plating facility is welcome to come to Bell Gardens um, to Metal Services. Hello, my name is Patrick King. Um, I just want to make a few additional comments on behalf of the members of the Metal Finishing Association. Um, as Wesley mentioned, um, you know, we've seen that controlling cross drafts, putting in the building enclosure, that's the basis, not a, not a permanent enclosure, but just the building enclosure and, and controlling the tanks that we now know are, are emitting, have, have done a lot uh, to remove, to reduce the uh, average emissions to levels below uh, those levels of concern. Um, there's some issues that we still have with some of the things that really haven't been proven to be necessarily to be useful that are could be very costly to us you know the source testing issue that we we uh, when source testing uh, uh, you know there's already things in the rule that require us to maintain the system the source test itself um, whether it's three years or five years basically showing that the design was right the equipment is the right kind of equipment the other things that we're doing make sure that it's working properly so the source test really doesn't accomplish that, and to require it every three years is excessive. Uh, other issues like tank uh, freeboard height in, uh, increases, uh, rinse water spray restrictions, compressed air drying restrictions, we're not really sure of the gains there, and they're, they're very costly. And the one-hour notification, um, when we're talking about something that's a, a chronic toxin like uh, Hex chrome uh, over a 30-year period or a 70-year period, depending on where you're, whether you're talking uh, commercial or uh, residential, uh, seems a, a little excessive. Especially when one of those requirements is to uh, notify if you fail a source test. Uh, having been a source tester myself, I mean, you do a source test. You know, you know the the, the um, samples go to the lab. Two weeks later, you get a a result back your your consultant writes a report over the next two or three weeks so you did a source test a month month and a half later you get a report and so where does that hour start uh, as to when we're supposed to report it those are the kind of things thank, thank you, thank you. keep quick uh, bill pierce the boeing company so 
just wanted to actually say thank you to staff. I mean, they've made themselves really available to work with this on a, this role and address some of our concerns and, and comments. Still working on a number of issues. I just wanted to mention two today. Have a uh, specific issue with one of the with one of the uh, new parametric monitoring requirements. Uh, just installing a uh, static gauge in the ducting. It's fairly easy to do that, but we're not sure how the information is going to actually be used. The other comment is just uh, there are a number of new requirements in this rule, and uh, and uh, <coughs> such as there's new record keeping that's going to be installed. The possibility that we're going to have to install some strip curtains, uh, some new. Uh, HEPA vacuum systems and uh, labeling for tanks and things like that. While some of the requirements have some additional time built in past the date of adoption, um, we're just looking that perhaps there just might be a 30 to 60 day time period so that we can incorporate all these new requirements into our day to day operations. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, Brian Ward, AAA Plating and the Metal Finishing Association. Um, I just want to address um, the the Tier 1, Tier 2 tank uh, delineation. We've uh, worked with staff. They've been very helpful at, at every step of the way, but we're still sort of struggling with the definition of the tanks. Um, we um, are concerned that realistically we have sort of these tanks that we now know are are bad actor tanks, the tanks that actually are emitters. And these are the ones that we're defining in the rule as tier two. Um, and those tanks, um, we know, uh, need to be controlled. Every Nobody's questioning that at all. It's the tier one tanks that we have now actually, be, because of testing, we understand that they are non-emitter tanks and therefore probably shouldn't have the same kinds of controls or the same kind of triggers. So those have been concerns for us. And just to address the, um, the, the PFOSH, just to touch on it just for a second, um, you know, um, if you look at like an apple, the seeds in an apple have a chemical in them called amygdalin. Uh, this amygdalin, if you digest it, becomes cyanide in your gut. The thing is, is that you don't see any kind of labeling, any kind of um, concern about cyanide poisoning because you're eating an apple because it would take 400 apples worth of seeds in order to get to those levels where they'd be an issue. That's kind of what we're talking about with the PFOS alternative uh, fume suppressants. You're talking about adding 1% of the whole tank solution is this fume suppressant to gain this huge dramatic effect. 15% of that 1% is actually the chemical that we're concerned with and then how much of that is actually coming off the tank. It is tiny. We're talking the tiniest of tiny. We're splitting hairs here. The the staff will go ahead and source test all of that stuff, and we're we're um, uh, excited to see what they come up with. But we're pretty confident that it's not going to be an issue. I just want to sort of address the concerns that this might end up being something that actually goes, because we know that the former concern with the PFOS materials were um, because of fire suppressants and stuff like that, and the huge quantities that were used in those kinds of applications. Thank, Thank you for your time. Charles Bell Metal Services. I wanted to uh, thank the staff for, for working with us. Uh, a lot of what is being proposed we have problem with, but uh, the process has been, has been back and forth. I just wanted to point out for at least from the defense side of the metal finishing, the plating industry, we're locked in our processes with our primes. For us to do work, we pre-qualified the work. Every step of the job is planned and instructed. And uh, we talk about changes getting away from hex chrome. Uh, it's a problem for us. We, to stay in business, have to do what the primes tell us to do. And uh, when the primes can get us away from hex chrome, allow us to process to a non-hex chrome process, we'll, we'll do it. We'd like to do it. But we're locked in. 
in a great percentage of the work that we do on how we do it. Thank you. Gotcha. Thank you. Well, what's May, yes. If I could just add, I think he's referring to the mil spec military right. specifications and the fact that they really can't deviate from that. So I just want to be clear. Am I calling in for tech? Yeah. All right. Any other questions from our board members before we decide to move forward? Okay. Um, I can hear you on the phone there if you can hear us. Um, <coughs> Susan, you have know, the, uh, the next time the reclaim quarterly update report. Is there anything detailed in that? Or? Um, we're, <clears throat> I don't know if we, we can just we can defer wait. this to the next. Let's go ahead and defer that to the next yeah. meeting. So we have a written report attached. Any other questions on any of that? All right. I mean, um, just to close out, uh, I just wanted to say we're okay. working with all the uh, all the industry, all the stakeholders on all these issues. We met with the Middle Finish Association yesterday to hash out all of the, the details. We heard all the comments. We're looking at ways that uh, sort of the pass through of, of what we can do, what we can't do, where we feel comfortable. So uh, we have a good understanding. Some areas we're going to agree to disagree. Other areas, I think we can you know try to you know work with them to uh, have consensus. So please do. All right. With that, uh, any other business from the board members? Any public comment on that? Not on the agenda? I have a public comment on the weekend. Oh. That's okay. Come on down. I'll make it quick. Please. Uh, my name is Joe Hauer. I'm uh, with Ramble, formerly Environ International, um, and one of the co chairs of the BizFed uh, ATMD and ARB Coalition. Uh, the Committee members should have received a letter from us uh, a couple days ago. I'd be happy to take any comments. I'm not going to repeat uh, what it said, other than our bottom line is we don't believe that rulemaking should be done for Reclaim Sunset until we know what the end game is. And right now, we, don't, we haven't seen what that looks like. We have a lot of questions and not much answers. Um, I will also say that the staff has been working really hard, Wayne and his team, to try and come up with that. Um, but it's looking to me and to others as if the governing board may have given staff a job they cannot do. Uh, that is to sunset reclaim and leave a functioning permitting and new source review system in place. Um, I, I, I suspect at least some of the staff would agree with that, maybe not in public. But uh, I would encourage the governing board to really look at this issue again. Uh, there are other ways to solve the problem, and some of the biggest reasons that Reclaim came under fire were things like, well, the oil refineries aren't implementing BARC. Well, AB 617 fixes that. Another one was that, gee, companies are shutting down their facilities, making lots of money selling credits, and allowing those oil refineries or others to not install BARC. That's been solved by the governing board. Um, I really think that another look at this issue, given the things that have happened since that vote to sunset reclaim, is warranted. There are ways to solve all those concerns and then some without actually terminating the reclaim program and also doing it in a way that will involve a whole lot less work for the staff, which has already got another a lot on their plate. I've been working with this agency for almost 40 years, and I've never seen the staff this busy. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Can we bring back some of the answers to some of those questions at the next meeting? or So the letter was addressed to Dr. Burke and I believe myself, and staff's preparing the response for Dr. Burke. Okay. One of the biggest issues that we have heard from a lot of the stakeholders is their view that there isn't a, a plan, a transition plan. Staff is working on that transition plan. We will have that shortly. I think that will answer a lot of questions. Staff is confident that we can continue to meet the board's directive as well as uh, the requirements set under 617. Okay. Um, we also um, used to be on the agenda we'd have the time, how long the presentations were supposed to be. I noticed that wasn't on this agenda, so it made it hard for me to guess as to how long this was going to go on. And uh, that would be helpful to, to me. Got it. Um, so again, any other business by board members? Anyone for public comment on items not on the agenda? Come on, Bill. 
I hope the camera picked up that nasty look that he just shot me. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't look this way, Bill. <laughs> I didn't see any last year. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill Lamar. I'm the executive director of the California Small Business Alliance. And uh, I, I'm, I'm here because at your January 19th meeting, uh, there was an, an error in transcription, either that or I was misquoted. And uh, it, it, it was approved by the governing board. Uh, and I understand after talking with the clerks of the board and staff that uh, it can't be it can't be changed. And it's on page two uh, at the at the last paragraph, high solvent. I, I actually said high solids. Uh, rather than high solvent, there is no solvent in uh, or VOC in in, uh, in UV coating in the printing industry. This is a uh, this is a UV brochure when I was at Edison, and that's what I said right here: high solids coatings. So uh, I just for the record, can that be just, changed in the record? Or how, how we do it? we can do it in the minutes because this can. Be, yeah. yeah, I just don't want that described to me for ever and ever. So. <laughs> Fair enough. It's actually wrong. As long as that's what he actually said. We have a recording of that meeting. I'm sure we can go back and listen, right? Okay. And, okay. <laughs> Got it. Thank you, both. Thank you. Anyone else have a public comment for the agenda? Thank you. All right. That will close, the, close this meeting and hopefully technology can get started right away.